Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. This one is a short one, and normally on this I say like Callum, you say it's a short one, but the script is absolutely massive. Today, it's fairly light, so we might not be here. <laughs> the last one, the last short one I recorded ended up being like 40 minutes long. I was like, Callum, we need to redefine short. Anyway, this one, uh, if you're new here, what happens here is uh, I have this script in front of me that Callum, the uh, the writer on The Casual Criminalist, has put together. I've not read it before. I don't even know this story. I don't, I'm assuming... Heilbronn. The episode's called cool, Defendant of Heilbronn. I'm assuming Heilbronn is somewhere in Germany because I looked up the pronunciation and it said German. Heilbronn. Um, so I guess excuse my German pronunciation ahead of time because I'm fairly bad at it. I did take German in school. I absolutely hated it. And I was taught German by a Scottish guy. He was a bit of a dickhead, to be honest. Anyway, let's just jump in. The greatest detectives in fiction have their white whale, the Moriarty to their Sherlock, a master criminal who slips their grasp time and time again. But these kinds of diabolical masterminds aren't always confined to the realms of fiction. Sometimes a real-life criminal emerges that leaves even the best detectives in the land mystified. The police in Germany found that out to their dismay back in the early 2000s. That's when they came up against a criminal so prolific, so proficient, that they were able to run rings around the authorities for years, leaving nothing but a microscopic calling card behind. The German papers dubbed her 15-year-long crime spree as the most mysterious serial crime of the past century. Now, normally on The Casual Criminalist, I make fun of criminals for being generally wildly incompetent. So I don't even, I don't know if Callum's being sarcastic here, but it does seem that this was actually a competent criminal, which is a rarity. By far the most intriguing character ever to make their most wanted list, Germany's very own Kaiser So Say went a great movie. Went by the suitably poetic moniker, The Phantom of Harbron. And just like her fictional counterpart, this crime lord had a terrifying power over her fellow crooks. But even the very best criminals can't escape the long arm of the law forever. That is not true. The best criminals absolutely can and they're never caught, because as we've discussed many times here on Cash, like most criminals and most crimes, they're just you you that you get away with them you'd or at every stage like committing the crime chance of getting caught very low chance of it going to trial very low chance of being convicted at trial very low it's like most crime is not uh you know most criminals get away with it but still don't do crime all right so how were the authorities finally able to track down the phantom of harbron and bring her to justice spoiler alert the answer is much dumber than you could ever imagine how exciting Death of an officer. April the 25th, 2007. Two police officers are taking a break from their patrol in the town of Harbron, southwest Germany. They decide to park their squad car at a spot uh, off the. Oh god. Thereisenweis, Thur maybe. And is this podcast big enough to now have people from Germany listening? If so, I apologize. <laughs> The Rice and Vice. I know it's kind of like Vice rather than Weiss, right? An area of town near the canal set aside for festivals. It's quiet for now, but preparations are underway for the May festival nearby. Michelle Kaiswetter is the rookie cop behind the wheel. Just 22 at the time, her partner, 24-year-old Martin A, is the passenger. The two spend her partner Martin A, but just the letter A. So is Martin A a criminal? Because I know in Germany they mask out the surname, right? Because we had that episode on Hassan and Abbas O, and we never learned their surname. So wait, is Martin A a criminal? I don't know. Anyways, the passenger. The two spend a few minutes smoking and talking before someone walks up behind their vehicle. Michelle and Martin assume that their visitor is looking for directions, so they start to roll down the windows. Within seconds, both officers are shot in the head. Wow, so he's definitely not a criminal, so I don't know why we're hiding his surname. Uh, that is absolutely brutal. With both of the young officers slumped over in the front seat, someone reaches through the window and wrenches Kai Sveta's gun from her holster, ripping out the studs from the leather as they do. They then loot the three magazines of ammunition from the lifeless officers before making their escape. It's weeks before Martin finally recovers from his coma. Whoa, he survives? Wait, so is it? This is crazy. I... I why is his so this is the guy with the the surname that is obscured miraculously the gunshot to the side of his face wasn't fatal he has little information for the detectives when he awakes 
it had all happened so fast that he didn't get a chance to look at his attacker or even figure out how many were involved. While the motive and circumstances of the murder remained a mystery, the forensic investigators were able to offer up a major break. The killer had left a trace of their DNA on the patrol car. A break in the case. Samples from the scene were transported back to the Institute for Forensic Medicine at the Medical University of Innsbruck. Analysts there managed to extract a full DNA profile from one of the culprits, presumably the one who had reached through the car window, to steal Kai Sveta's service weapon. Analysis of the sample yielded some surprising revelations about their identity. For one, they were female. And by cross-referencing the sample with data from the Austrian DNA Central Laboratory, the analysts were able to say with reasonable certainty that their suspect was Eastern European perhaps Russian. Yeah, this is crazy. I had that uh, 23, is it 23 and me? No, I had Ancestry done, which is like a similar thing. And it's like, it's crazy. They'd be like, yeah, you're from here and with this and like all of this. And this person's probably like your fourth cousin. It's wild. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive stuff. Most important of all, though, was the discovery that this mysterious Slavic cop killer had struck before multiple times. She was implicated in crimes stretching all the way back to a murder in the early 1990s. Since then, she had been terrorizing the continent with a string of home invasions and thefts. All of these details were released to the papers who dubbed the culprit the Phantom of Harbron. This signaled the start of one of Germany's most mysterious manhunts, which would end up consuming 16,000 hours of police overtime and millions of euros in expenses. All of this went towards building a profile of one of the worst criminals in modern European history. This this reminds me, it's, it's unrelated, but uh, there was a brilliant story. It was in like the Irish papers or something about some person who'd been on some crazy speed. They were speeding all over Ireland, like, and they had this person in their records, like doing crazy speeding tickets all the time. And then, the, I, this sounds like an urban legend, doesn't it? I don't know if this is actually true or where I read it, but it turns out in the end that the person's name was, I think it was like Polish for driver's license. So whenever they'd been, you know, pulled them over, they'd taken out the Polish driver's license when they just wrote in like the, uh, the name for Polish, whatever Polish driver's license is, whatever the Polish word for driver's license is, they put it in the name. <laughs> That's quite amusing. But that definitely sounds like an urban legend. <laughs> A crime spree for the ages. It was a colorful biography to say the least. To list all of the crimes that the Phantom was implicated in would take a fair while, so we'll just give you a best of compilation. The first time the Phantom's DNA was discovered was on a teacup found at a murder scene of a 62-year-old woman in Ida Orpstein, Ob Oberstein back in 1993. The elderly lady had been strangled to death with wire, which she had used for a flower arrangement. Advances in forensic testing meant that the authorities could extract the Phantom's DNA from the warehouse mug in 2001. This happened to be the very same year that she committed her second murder, another elderly victim killed in the uh, killed in Freiburg in Bre Bre Breisgau. <laughs> In March, he was also strangled, this time with gardening twine. According to the cold case records, not only was the Phantom of Harbour on a cold-blooded killer, she also had a penchant for theft and home invasion. For example, in October 2001, she carelessly smeared her DNA on a biscuit left in a caravan, which she had burgled. Robbing caravans isn't usually very profitable, unless your fence gives a good price for travel kettles. <laughs> So, in 2004, the female crime lord graduated to stealing gemstones. Her genetic calling card was found on a fake gun left behind after a jewelry store robbery in Arbois, France in 2004. Then in 2006, she broke into an electronics store in Austria, then a residential building in Burbach later that year, then an optician's in gal Neukirchen a year later. Throughout this period, she had also been implicated in around 20 car and bike thefts as well across both Germany and Austria. Apparently, she was using funds from these robberies to fund a drug habit, habit as her DNA was found on an abandoned heroin needle back in 2001. Wow, so this person is an enormously pro prolific thief and also has a heroin addiction. I have to, I'm quite impressed. I mean, not by the murders. I'm impressed that she managed to get away with the crime despite being on heroin is what I'm saying. That's it. You might think that the Phantom had made a positive change in her life, moving from strangling pensioners to a bit of harmless robbery, but it wasn't long before she returned to her murderous ways. Her next crime was the killing of an officer in Harbron, the act which finally brought the authorities onto her scent. Rather than lay low after incurring the wrath of the law, the woman without a face doubled down, committing a bunch more homicides in a short period. In January 2008, her DNA was found on a car which had been used to move the bodies of three murder victims, Georgian nationals who were murdered in Heppenheim. As we all know, it's very difficult to kill three 
Georgian men single-handedly, so our phantom femme fatale had some backup for this one. The same was true for many of her other crimes. In fact, some of her helping hands have even been caught in the act over the years. The phantom was apparently quite careful in picking her accomplices, never working with the same crew twice. Her captured prisoners were from a wide variety of backgrounds – Serbs, Slovaks, Iraqis, Romanians, and Albanians. What's impressive is that a female criminal was able to command such loyalty and fear from all of these hardened criminals that none of them dared ratted her out. They refused to tell the cops anything about her. The fact that seems so risky. Like you're involving so many people in your crimes, which is usually something I say on the crack casual criminalist is like, don't do that. Don't involve other people in your crimes. They're going to tell on you. Quite, quite incredible. The Phantom was especially active during the months of March and April 2008 when she and her gang broke into four different homes in Germany, holding the owners hostage while they looted their belongings. After leaving behind traces of her DNA at six crime scenes in just four months, the Phantom was clearly becoming either cocky or careless. It wouldn't be long now before the authorities finally cracked the case. But not before one last gruesome murder would be added to her rap sheet. The final victim of the Phantom of Harbron was a nursing assistant, murdered in Weinsberg in October 2008. This was the 40th crime scene where the Phantom's DNA was found and the sixth murder that she was implicated in. Despite having caught the scent of her at all those crimes, the authorities were no closer to putting a face to the name. The Phantom, in keeping with her title, always managed to avoid showing up on security cameras, meaning that she must have planned her crimes meticulously. In fact, apart from trace DNA evidence, she left no other puzzle pieces behind for the cops not even as much as a footprint. How are you so careful over all of this stuff but unaware that DNA is a thing? Had our mystery killer been operating in the days before complex DNA analysis, nobody would have even known she existed. That's how good she was. Witnesses rarely caught sight of her, but those few who did reported that they mistook her for a man. Was she deliberately disguising herself to throw her pursuers off the scent, or perhaps to pass as a man among the hard-boiled criminal and underworld of Germany? Whatever the intention, it worked like a charm, and no witness nor accomplice ever managed to successfully identify the mystery woman. So, by the time the authorities finally tracked her down, there was a €300,000 bounty on offer for anyone with information that could lead to her arrest. No matter how many crimes they linked her to, the Phantom remained a phantom. They had plenty of information about her. She was a heroin adult gangster with world-class heist skills who couldn't stand elderly horticulturalists. <laughs> Still, nothing which could actually help them track her down, and in their desperation, the police even enlisted the help of self-proclaimed psychics to point them in the direction of the elusive serial killer. You know when you go into the psychic, it's like, oh, bottom of the barrel stuff. Also, don't. It's pointless, and it does nothing. Please stop. That's that's uh, your German tax heroes at work there, Germans. But it was the good folk at the forensics lab who finally nabbed her. What a surprise. It was the forensics guys using science rather than the psychics using basically witchcraft. The Phantom Strikes Again In 2009, the Phantom would be implicated in a violent death one last time. This time it was a body that was found burned in 2002, which still hadn't been identified by the police. The forensic techs were pursuing a new lead, attempting to match DNA from the corpse with that found on an asylum application form from the 1990s. The man who filled out the form had to provide his fingerprints, meaning a trace amount of DNA could be lifted from the forms. That is so cool. You're giving them fingerprints, but you're also giving them DNA, because there's, it's, there's just enough on there. That's wild. When they ran the sample, they made a shocking discovery. The DNA on the form belonged to none other than the Phantom of Harbron. So not only had she been breaking into homes and murdering gangsters, she had also been filling out forms on behalf of asylum seekers, disguising herself as a male asylum seeker. Question mark. Do you think it's, multi it's multiple people? You think? I mean, that's what's been in the back of my mind. And that somehow, but then how's the DNA getting spread? I don't read these ahead. This is a real mystery. But I'm thinking like, I'm really thinking along the lines of the Polish driver's license guy. Like somehow it's DNA getting spread around or like maybe the lab screwing it up. Like they're getting something, something weird is going on. Hold on, this story is starting to get a bit ridiculous, is it not? That's exactly what the lab technicians thought as they tried to explain why the DNA of someone who was completely of a different race and sex was showing up in their results. They tried repeating the tests, and obviously the Phantom's DNA was nowhere to be found. Had she snuck in and wiped the papers, wiped down the papers right under their nose? Of course not. That's ridiculous, but not half as ridiculous as the revelations yet to come. It's gotta be lab error, right? That's what I'm settling in on. The Comic Conclusion 
See, this bit of confusion in the lab turned out to be the undoing of the whole thing. So, and now I feel a bit stupid about making my psychic comments because the people in the lab, if they did, they screwed it up. <laughs> I mean, the psychics did too. Well, they just did nothing, okay? It meant that the police could finally track down the dastardly phantom to a hideout, which was a packaging warehouse in Bavaria. Bit of a strange lair for one of Europe's most wanted. No, the packaging facility belonged to... Good lord, some German-named company, which is extremely long, who had a contract with... Griner Bio One, a major supplier of cotton swabs to forensic labs around Germany. Curiously, the labs in the state of Bavaria itself used a different supplier, and the Phantom had never decided to strike there. On top of that, the packaging facility just happened to employ several Eastern European women on its assembly line. If you haven't figured out where I'm going with this, don't feel bad. It took the entire German police force two years to cotton on. I make no apology for that. Oh, because they've cotton on uh, for, the, for the pun. Bit of a boom. Slowly but surely, an embarrassing reality was starting to materialize. The Phantom of Harboron never actually existed, or rather, she did exist, but she was no criminal. She was just a middle-aged factory worker whose only crime was a lax attitude towards contamination protocol. Which, I mean, considering the effects of this, is fairly substantial. The German police chased their tails for two years, blew two million euros, whipped up the public into a panic, and presumably let dozens, of, let, let dozens of real criminals walk, all for the sake of this one world-class forensics blunder. Take a second to appreciate the majesty of it. Forty different crimes across three countries pinned on some random woman. Although if she was the criminal, this would be the, a genius cover. Huh? Huh? It wasn't. That's not, that's not what happens. The supplier actually had to release a statement on their website reminding everyone that at no point did they say that their swabs were suitable for DNA testing. They sterilized them before shipping, sure, but this doesn't destroy any microscopic bits of human that might have been sprinkled onto the product. So all this time, the blood, skin, sweat, and saliva cells they'd been testing belonged to the women packing the swabs. Keep that in mind next time you put one of these into your ear. I don't think you've got to worry about the, the micro... It's sterilized. You're fine. But that is wild. Also... This is not on them, then, because the company is saying, like, we don't use these for DNA testing. They're cotton swabs. I'm sure they make specific cotton swabs for DNA testing that don't have DNA left on them. Don't cheap out, German police. You've got to buy the proper ones. If you're amazed at how this whole escapade managed to reach such comic proportions, you're not alone. The papers in public were appalled that the police never worked it out sooner. For one, so many of the crimes which the Phantom were implicated in just didn't fit the profile. She had seemingly taken a break from murder and mayhem to break into our high school in 2007 alongside some teenaged accomplices. Apparently, between murdering old women and gangsters, you sometimes need a night off to go and smoke some weed with 15-year-olds. Brilliant. And the rest of her alleged accomplices had been telling the police the truth for years. Imagine it from their perspective for a second. The police track you down and arrest you for a robbery which you committed all on your lonesome, but instead of demanding to know where the diamonds are stashed, the detective slams his fists on the table and shouts, What is das Phantom? I like that uh, Callum wrote it in uh, German for me. That's brilliant. And you instantly know what it means. No matter how much you try and explain the situation to them, they won't hear it. Maybe they even offer you a deal for turning in a woman who simply doesn't exist, like something out of Kafka. To be fair to the police, though, they weren't completely dense. They did suspect from time to time that something wasn't quite right about the picture of the evidence they were painting. They even identified DNA contamination as a potential problem early on, but tests on the swabs never turned up any results back then, so they discarded the idea. As one detective quoted in the de German tabloid Bild, the things were double packed, so we thought they were the Mercedes of cotton swabs. <laughs> and that is how they decided. Brilliant work, police. So the myth of the Phantom was allowed to snowball on, leading to one of the most embarrassing, expensive blunders in the history of policing. And now for a wrap up. So, what did everyone learn from this little catastrophe? Well, clearly, stricter quality standards were needed for products to be used in forensics labs. What? Who would have thought? Nowadays, the German police only order swabs which have been sterilized with ethylene oxide, which scrubs off all biological matter. Well, it would be a bit weird if they didn't learn from that mistake. We also learned that despite the fantasy CSI shows have told, sold us, forensics is far from a perfect science. Whilst in some cases DNA is the smoking gun which brings a criminal to justice, in others it can point the finger at someone else completely innocent, like our Eastern European factory worker. But there's one last possibility to uh, consider. What if all of this was just a perfect cover story? I said that, but surely not. Stick with me for a moment because I'm about to outline the best new conspiracy theory you've heard all year. I mean, it's only February when I'm recording this. <laughs> So it's not been a long year, but all and also it's the year of like COVID and Bill Gates and all that crazy shit that people are like, he's burning chips in it. He's not. Relax. <laughs> 5G and COVID, all of this crazy stuff. Please stop it. 
After arriving in Germany to, an embar- to embark on her career as an underground hitman, little old Svetlana takes a job at a packing plant for her forensic cotton swabs. She sprinkles her DNA all over the product, rendering any tests, by- <laughs> tests against her null and void. By day, she works the factory floor so that by night, she can murder and rob with impunity, becoming the greatest crime lord Germany has ever known. In the words of Kaiser Soze himself, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Well played, Phantom. Well played. Dismembered Appendix As for the crime which kick-started the manhunt, it turns out that Officer Kaisverter was actually murdered by the neo-Nazi group National Socialist Underground. Her suspected killers took their own lives in 2011, so we'll never know for sure. We do, however, have DNA evidence linking them to the crime, and we know how reliable that. Let's not throw all DNA out of the window just because this one German guy chose to use the Mercedes of double swabbed swab whatever DNA evidence usually pretty good also those neo-nazis probably did it allegedly anyway this has been an episode of the casual criminalist if you enjoyed this show and you're watching it on YouTube don't forget to smash that like if you didn't enjoy it there's a dislike button for your use as well thank you YouTube subscribe if you're listening as a podcast because this show goes out in two formats what Uh, why not leave a review if you're listening on spotify you can do neither of those things thank you spotify and thank you for listening